It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha and good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in here on this Wednesday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yenji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we're going to kind of change things up, and we are going to be actually focusing on tourism. That's right. We are joined by the best of the best, uh, HLTA, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association CEO and uh, President Mufi Hanneman, of course, former mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Good morning, Yuji. Good morning, Ryan. Well, we've got a lot to talk about, so let's dive right in. Uh, let's start broad strokes. How is the industry doing in this moment? How has the holidays? How was the holiday season? And looking ahead in the next quarter and beyond, how do you think things are going? Well, uh, the uh, our December numbers uh, weren't as good as we had anticipated or we had hoped for. Uh, certainly uh, being at the 70 to 75 percent occupancy level uh, in years past. Uh, this is a time of year where because it's the festive season, you know, we'd get 90 percent, 100 percent occupancy. So as we head into the first quarter, we knew uh, back then in 2022 20, that the first quarter was going to be a little bit of a struggle. And that's what we're seeing right now. Numbers are still down in terms of the occupancy rate. Uh, 70 percent, 75 percent uh, for the first couple of weeks in, in January. And uh, certainly uh, the international arrivals is something that we had hoped for. It would happen by now. Uh, and it hasn't happened as quickly as we wanted to. So uh, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle here. But everyone is uh, sort of prepared and trying to do what they need to do uh, to ensure that uh, 2023 and going forward, uh, we can experience uh, more robust numbers so that we can keep people employed, keep them in their jobs because there's some fear that you know there may be some cutback in hours and so forth. And every property is different, every county is different. Uh, but certainly, we're just pleased that we are open for business. And now we just got to go forward and try to promote the, the fact that we're looking for the respectful, mindful traveler to come here. Uh, we're very uh, intent on making sure that they understand. Uh, the way they come here, there's a, also a special obligation, responsibility uh, to help the local people understand uh, and appreciate visitors coming here, but more importantly, that they're going to leave it better than they found it and certainly not going to uh, do the kind of things that have happened sometimes in the past and continue to happen today. I want to focus it a little more on the uh, Asian market, as we, uh, as you alluded to. Uh, you know, this was an industry, of course, that played such a significant role in Hawaii's tourism industry in the past before the pandemic. Uh, and as you mentioned, we have yet to see that return of that uh, Asian traveler. Uh, can you maybe explain a little bit about how the marketing uh, moving forward will look like to try to entice, uh, say, the Japanese visitors, especially back to the islands? And, and what might be the reason why we're not seeing this expected rebound that was initially anticipated? Well, there's some things, obviously, that are outside of our control with respect to that. It's the country of Japan and some of the policies that they've put forward. Uh, if you go to Japan today, they are still masking all over the place, indoors, outdoors, what have you. Uh, so uh, that is uh, an issue of the, the fear of Japanese people traveling, even as much as we have welcomed in the past and has always been a great experience uh, coming to Hawaii. Then there were some internal policies that they put into place there. Uh, for example, uh, for the latter part of last year, they were basically asking Japanese to stay at home uh, and doing a staycation type of policy to help the Japanese economy first before they traveled abroad. And then, of course, uh, the yen uh, also being weak didn't help things, rising fuel prices and the like. Uh, but what has been very good for us is that uh, the Japanese travel companies, the Japanese airlines that we deal with, uh, want to uh, start robust travel to Hawaii. And the Hawaii Tourism Authority and our Japan office there have also engaged uh, in a meaningful participation to ensure that uh, the marketing efforts are there for the Japanese to understand uh, that we want them to come back. Uh, and thirdly, I thought it was a very good move on the part of Governor Josh Green before he was even governor 
Uh, he went to Japan uh, in November uh, and started to lay the groundwork as previous governors have done before, taking a page from what Governor Ariyoshi and Governor Wahe used to do. Uh, and I would accompany them on those trips. We'd go to Japan and thank them for all the previous travel and then say to them, we need you to come back. If you come back, this is what we can guarantee you. So we need to do some things on our end too to ensure when they come here uh, that they're going to be able to stay at places they want to stay. We need to also market the fact that uh, those that have been here before, uh, we'd like them to be able to understand that there may be some new attractions, uh, new things that may appeal to them. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, definitely sooner rather than later, we'll see some improvement in that area. area. Uh, and it's no question uh, the 1.5 million that we used to depend upon from Japan, uh, we're far from that now. Hopefully we'll get closer to that by the end of this year and certainly by 2024. So it's still a long haul, but there's no question. We like the Asian visitor, the Japanese traveler to come here. They stay longer. They're respectful, mindful travelers. Uh, they'll ob obey our rules and our regulations, especially now as we talk about Malama in uh, Hawaii. Uh, they've done that. They have been the epitome of the respectful, mindful traveler. Uh, they take Omiyagi back, uh, and then they also uh, make sure that their friends and neighbors know how wonderful an experience it is in Hawaii. So that's where we're aiming for. Uh, we're not giving up hope, and certainly we see some signs out there that we could see a more Japanese travelers come here. You know, with tourism, you want to eliminate any barriers to entry. And I'm interested to know your thoughts. You you mentioned the governor, the governor's so-called green-free proposal, this idea of charging some kind of an environmental tax, if you will, upon entry for all visitors coming to Hawaii. Um, you know, what are your thoughts as an industry on that? Do you think that creates any kind of a barrier for folks wanting to come here? Uh, and, you know, what's your organization's position and what are you hearing from your members? That's a good question, uh, Yunji. Uh uh, Governor knows <laughs> we talk a lot. I've always had a personal and professional opposition to just a basic green fee where you're going to assess someone <clears throat> a fee uh, that will go in, into the general fund. You're adding to the cost of coming to Hawaii, for example. Secondly, what's the nexus to the tourism industry? What's the connection, especially if you're taking it from a traveler and you're not taking it from a local resident? So what we have basically advocated through the years in our opposition to a green fee that has come through the legislature at times is that you need to assess what is called an impact or user fee. We can support that. When I was on the Honolulu City Council back in the 1990s, I authored and championed the legislation that created a special fund for Hanama Bay. Uh, where we said, in effect, that we're going to charge the visitor to go down to the bay and it will be put into a special fund for the ongoing maintenance, preservation uh, of the bay, and that everyone have to go through an educational program. That's what you go through that video, and you're able to understand what is expected of you when you actually visit uh, the bay or the nature preserve, as we like to call it. And then we also said they need to be closed uh, at least one full day a week again. Uh, keeping in mind the need to preserve it uh, going forward uh, and to make sure that the locals understood that they were welcome. So the fee was access, is access only to visitors uh, who come from other places. But if you're a local resident, well, it's anathema to even think about charging you to use, uh, to use the beach, if you will. So that is what we support. And we're very, very happy to uh, see that the governor has kind of pivoted his position uh, because some legislative leaders have also said uh, in particular, uh, Senator Ron Kochi, uh, that a fee being charged to use some of our state parks or to access our state parks is something that uh, the Senate could support. Uh, I know Speaker Psyche and the House in the past has been uh, opposed to green fees, so, but they support this concept of an impact user fee. The industry can support that because there's a nexus uh, to the visitor industry. The parks will make it not only better maintained, uh, or whatever it's going to be assessed, trails, what have you, uh, not just for uh, visitors to benefit from, but for our local residents, because we're not going to exclude locals uh, from being able uh, to access our, our valleys, our parks, our trails, what have you. So uh, we encourage that. Uh, we think that with what has happened with some of the bills that we've seen coming from the legislature, it's not a blanket green fee anymore. We're seeing more of a fee that talks about an impact fee, a user fee that goes back to a specific fund to that particular uh, asset or preserve or what have you that they're trying to ensure uh, that has good maintenance going forward. We can support that. Uh, and so I think it surprises people whenever I say that. 
but I say, look, we, we want to be part of the community. This is part of how we uh, want to malama uh, our land. Uh, and therefore, uh, having visitors pay for it, especially if it's something very, very popular, we have no problem with that. We just don't like when it sneaks into a general fund and then it gets used for other purpose. And there's no nexus back to that particular place that it was uh, a fee was extracted for. Well, in staying on this, when you we're talking about this from a practical standpoint, uh, how do you think that is going to be one uh, developed and, and assessed to figure out which locations would qualify for this fee? And how would that be implemented in some of these locations? We've already known the establishment of some of these fees uh, in such areas, as you mentioned, uh, you know, like Honolulu Bay, we also know Diamond Head, there's other locations on the neighbor islands as well. Uh, but looking at uh, identifying these locations, how would you think that it's going to be determined? And uh, also just how would you logistically collect these fees at these locations? Yeah, that's a good question too, Ryan. You know, it, actually some of the neighbor islands are already doing it and they're doing it well. They're doing it on the North Shore. So I think the first thing you have to look at is uh, uh, upgrading your, your reservation system, if you will. And there's some apps that are being developed right now across the board uh, that will ensure that there's an orderly way of uh, being able to assess the number of people that are going to visit it uh, at a particular time. Uh, so that uh, has to be put in place. Secondly, uh, it's going to require buy-in from the community. So what uh, HTA has done through their destination management plan, uh, they have basically uh, gathered these uh, groups uh, throughout uh, the counties, working very closely with county offices, where it's the residents that are identifying hot spots, if you will, uh, or troublesome areas that need to be addressed. And when the topic of user fee comes on, then of course uh, they weigh in and say, on our particular island, this is where we think would be appropriate. Uh, the other thing is going to be important is a collaboration from state government. So if you're talking about many of these outdoor attractions and the like, then you got to bring in the Department of Land and Natural Resources. They have to weigh in and they have to be a part of it. So all of these components uh, is going to be something that's uh, very important to put into place. Uh, but the model is basically there, starting with Hanama Bay, uh, also with what's happening uh, with some of the neighbor islands. And therefore, uh, the collaboration that will take place, I think, will lead to a very orderly transition. And more importantly, for people to understand the visitor industry is not going to oppose impact fees. As long as, as I said earlier, we're going to do it the way that we like to see it done. Uh, and that's what, what was one of the problems that we had with it, just collecting a green fee. To your very question, who's going to collect it? Uh, the airlines said uh, they'd have difficulty doing it. Certainly the hotels didn't want to do that because we already collect the hotel room tax. So this way here, what's done and collected uh, at that particular uh, spot uh, that they're going to be going to, uh, which is how Hanama Bay fees are collected, is how we like to see it done with an appropriate app that takes advantage of technology. You know, given that the tourism market is not where, you know, you and in the, in the industry would like to see it, that there is a softness to it, if you will. I'm interested to know what your thoughts are on how things are going in Waikiki. There were several high profile incidents, uh, you know, violent incidents that happened in recent months. The mayor has said that this is a priority to crack down, working closely with Honolulu prosecutor Steve Alm on this safe and sound program. How do you think that's going and, and are things turning around? Is that message that Waikiki is safe and, and is it actually safe? getting out. You know, Yunji, uh, we cannot lose our competitive edge in that regard. Uh, from the time I was mayor uh, to uh, today, we need to continue to say that we are one of the safest big cities in America to visit. Uh, it's one thing to, to, to promote this place as a great place to come. And uh, it's one thing, too, for our people to welcome them here, have great attractions, hotels, resorts, restaurants, what have you, Hawaiian music, culture and the like. Uh, but if people don't feel safe, they will not come. So uh, I give uh, big kudos uh, to Prosecutor Alm, uh, Mayor Blanjardi and his administration, and working with the major stakeholders in Waikiki, uh, starting with our organization, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, the Waikiki Business Improvement District, uh, Waikiki Improvement Association, uh, VASH, and the Hawaii Hotel Visitor Industry Security Association. It was the five of us that got together and for the past couple of years have been very loud uh, in our need uh, for a program here, here that replicates weed and seed that we've seen in other areas. Because we thought that, that maybe that was the missing piece uh, that we needed to do here. 
Uh, I've had great success with weed and seed. When I was mayor, I see it today working wonders in Chinatown. It's worked very well out in Eva in the Waipahu area. Uh, so we wanted to see it established here. And the difference with Waikiki is that we were willing to put our money where our mouth is. So it's thanks to Paul Kosasa with ABC Stores. Uh, at one of our meetings, he basically stepped forward and said, hey, look, I'll put up uh, the initial seed money for my foundation, but I'd like the city uh, to match it. Uh, and so he offered $90,000 to get it going, the city. Uh, and we worked with uh, Council Chair Tommy Waters to make sure the council was supportive. Um, Mayor's administration, prosecutor's office. And so that's what we have in place now. So we're at the beginning stages of what we call now safe and sound. So what does that mean? Uh, it's a weed and seed type of approach. Number one, we still have to uh, implement uh, strong uh, measures uh, to make sure that we are identifying those uh, troublemakers, those who are continuing to wreak havoc uh, in a place like Waikiki with two square miles uh, and thousands of visitors every day, with residents to keep in mind, with workers that come in there. So um, that's the part that the police department and police chief uh, Logan is very much engaged uh, in this, uh, coming in and working with the folks that uh, are uh, in charge of Waikiki and the prosecutor's office. Where we come in from the community is the seating part, and that is making sure that we have programs that we can put into place. So if there are youth uh, that are creating problems, uh, we have engaged the Adult, adult Friends for Youth uh, to identify the youth that are infiltrating uh, Waikiki from time to time. Uh, and they come from all over the island, and they have a great track record uh, with identifying who these uh, juveniles are because people who work for Adult Friends for Youth, many of them have gone through uh, that particular problematic time of their childhood and now want to be able to ensure that the kids know that that's not the way to do it. Um, we also have to engage um, other uh, aspects of positive uh, programs that are going to put them to work. Uh, also job training programs. Uh, we have to deal with the homelessness that are often uh, part of uh, the problems that we have here. So all of those things require a joint collaborative effort. So it's just starting. We're very happy that safe and sound is in Waikiki. We're in the process of uh, selecting an executive director that will run Safe and Sound on a daily basis. And we've tasked Waikiki Improvement District Association uh, to basically uh, lead our efforts in that regard, where we are all are going to help them because we recognize uh, if we lose our edge on some of these things that are happening in Waikiki and people feel it's not safe, they will not come. So we're pleased that uh, the police Department and uh, the Blanchardi administration understand that uh, as they focus on Chinatown, the concern has always been, well, are you going to focus on Chinatown and not look at Waikiki anymore? Uh, we know they're going to do both. You can't do one or the other. You can't focus on Waikiki and not look at Chinatown. But certainly Waikiki is very important because we get the bulk of the visitors that come here. Uh, I want to switch gears a little and talk more about just the overall workforce here in the islands and specifically as it pertains, of course, to your industry, what you're seeing and hearing from the hotels. We know that uh, shortly after the pandemic, there uh, continues to be this need for workers and, and many of them come from the hospitality and food service industry where hotels and other restaurants within the area were looking for workers. Uh, what are you hearing from the hotels right now in terms of the overall staffing and, and what are uh, where have these workers returned? Are these hotels still having any staffing issues with the labor shortage? Yeah, it just depends on the hotel. Uh, some of them are doing quite well. Workers are coming back. And as you know, we lost a lot of them uh, during the pandemic. Many of them left the islands. They went to uh, the Ninth Island. Uh, uh, they're uh, up in Vegas or other areas. Uh, so therefore, it's been an ongoing uh, challenge to get them back. Uh, but as we continue to experience uh, better numbers and arrivals, then we can plan in advance uh, that we're going to need them to come back. So it's not just uh, a problem that and a challenge with the hotel industry, certainly the restaurants, retail, we're all facing that. Uh, and we just need to continue to press forward. So that's the short term uh, answer to that. It just varies from hotel to hotel. Uh, certainly, uh, we're looking more now at thinking what we need to do is a, a long-term uh, challenge to this. Now, the hospitality industry will always employ the greatest number of people. Uh, and so we need to make this industry much more appealing and exciting uh, to those that are going to enter the workforce. Uh, no longer uh, should it be construed as just, well, I don't want to be a housekeeper. I don't want, even though housekeepers are 
the best paid housekeepers uh, basically in the United States, uh, what we pay here uh, with full health benefits and the like. There are a lot of jobs uh, that we need uh, in the industry from housekeeping jobs, because it's an important integral part of the industry, uh, as well as uh, jobs in the management, marketing, uh, food and beverage, uh, promotion, uh, and basically just operating uh, a hotel or resort. So we have engaged in a major robust workforce development initiative where for the first time, uh, we are gonna engage with the state to do paid uh, high school internships uh, at one of our hospitality uh, properties uh, or uh, operations. So we have a, a program going forward with the Department of Education where we're identifying uh, a number of schools in every county and we've actually engaged the Council of Native Hawaiian Advancement, CNHA, that specializes in workforce development. Uh, but they haven't really done major uh, workforce development in the tourism industry. So they're providing some seed money. We're providing uh, some money from HLTA, working with the Department of Education. Uh, and we're going to begin with uh, hotel uh, and airlines and our transportation company uh, offering paid internships. Uh, so we've got schools in it, we're calling it a pilot program because eventually, uh, thanks to Ways and Means Chair Donovan De La Cruz, he's put some money into the budget that's with the Department of Labor. And then we're going to expand that program once we show how it's going to work. So we've got, for example, Lanai High School. Whoever thinks of Lanai High School, uh, they often get left out, but I wanted them to be a part of it because we have a major resort there uh, that can take a student from Lanai and put them on a paid internship program. The whole idea is that they'll get to understand and appreciate the importance of the industry. Number two, uh, it'll make it attractive and appealing for them to work. And if they do well, uh, it can actually translate into a job. And that's what exactly has happened with many of our mentoring programs that we do right now uh, with university students engaged in hospitality. For the past five years, we've done a program called Generational Mentoring, where uh, these students have come in uh, and uh, they've often been employed full time uh, after they've completed uh, their six-month internship uh, with a property manager. Uh, we also have revived another important aspect of this, which we want to provide full four-year scholarships to public high school students to go to the UH Tim School. We started it a couple of years ago when Chris Tatum uh, was the head of HTA, uh, and we call it our Whole Lena Scholars. They get a full four-year ride, if they're selected, to go to the Scheider School, of travel and tourism, uh, and therefore be able to now come out of it uh, with a very robust experience of having been, uh, having their expenses at college paid for. So thanks again to Chair Dela Cruz, we've now added the room and board component to it. And this year we've revived it because of the pandemic, they had to slow that down. And so I know that Dean Rowley and us are very, very happy that we'll have qualified, eager high school students uh, who will be enrolled at the Tim School uh, with a full four-year scholarship uh, paid for uh, by the state of Hawaii, uh, and they'll be able to hopefully have the incentive to stay at home. That's always been the concern of the legislature when they look at management positions. They say, well, how many of them are local? How many of them are actually here? Are you folks still bringing folks in from the mainland? Well, we always look to have local people involved, but from time to time, we need folks to come from the outside to be here, and hopefully they adopt our culture, they want to be part of it, and they, and they do well. And so this, I think, will accelerate uh, the incentives for local residents who want to go into the hospitality industry because of these incentives that we're offering. And we're going to be very aggressive and ambitious about workforce development. I want to ask you about some personal news as well. Uh, we know that you were recently appointed to the U.S. Travel and Tourism Board, along with Peter Ingram from Hawaiian Airlines. Uh, just t briefly tell us about, you know, the paper did an article about this. Folks can look that up. But uh, just briefly tell us about what this means and, and how this could benefit the state. Oh, this is a big benefit for the state. Uh, I'm very humbled to have been appointed by the Biden administration to advise uh, Secretary Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce. Uh, there are 32 of us uh, from across the nation representing different aspects of the industry. Um, and Peter Ingram and I uh, got picked from Hawaii. And so we have two of the 32 slots. And this is very, very important because uh, our main emphasis is, first of all, is to be looking at how we can uh, increase international travel to the United States safely. And that's what every state wants, not just Hawaii. 
uh, but they also have legislation that they've approved that this 32 member board is gonna help uh, with a new position that Congress is calling for, which is an assistant secretary of tourism in the Department of Commerce. Every major foreign country has a tourism czar. Uh, the United States has never had one, and I've lobbied for this for a long time uh, since I was chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Tourism Committee back then uh, in 2010 of the need to have this kind of position. So it's finally coming to pass, uh, and we're excited about it because now we'll have a champion within the government, uh, basically uh, making sure that our lawmakers, the administration understands the importance uh, of hospitality. So uh, it's a great appointment for Hawaii. Uh, I'm humbled by it. And uh, Peter Ingram and I have already talked about the things that we'd like to do uh, to ensure that uh, Hawaii has a strong voice. And at the end of the day, uh, we'll benefit from this and also be able to put things on the table that'll help the 49 other states and territories uh, and possessions of the United States in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Well, staying on personal news, uh, your name was actually brought up in an article in the Honolulu Star Advertiser yesterday about a potential interest in the uh, new athletic director position. Of course, we know that David Matlin will be retiring at the end of this athletic season, and the search is now underway for a new athletic director. Your name was in, uh, mentioned in this article. we got to ask you, is there any interest there? Is this something that you would actually pursue? Well, let, let me focus on the pursuit part. I am not pursuing that position uh, at this point in time. I'm in a great place. Uh, I love what I'm doing. But, you know, I've always been one uh, to basically take a call <laughs> or, or look at a text and so forth. So I can tell you right now, uh, that's not the first time my name's been mentioned. Uh, every time that happens, I get a lot of calls. I get a lot of texts and so forth. And so I'm listening. Uh, obviously, the UH athletic director's position is very key. Uh, I love sports. Both of you love sports. Uh, it, it's not just something that's important uh, for the university, but it's important for the state. Uh, so at this particular point in time, I'm, I'm just listening to what people have to say. Uh, and certainly, I've, I've been very interested uh, in, in sports all my life. I, I do a girls basketball program. I've got three of my players that played for Team Aloha right now playing for Coach Beeman and, and contributing at a very high level uh, to that. And I've always been part of the football program, helping to recruit and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love University of Hawaii uh, athletics. So it's an important program. But at this point in time, uh, I'm just listening uh, because I've got a lot on my plate, as we talked about today. <laughs> uh, yeah, we always like to bring in the comments. And here we're hearing it. Mufi would be perfect for the AD job. I'm sure you're hearing quite a bit of that. You know, given that where you are at in, in this point in time, your recent appointment that we just talked about with the Biden administration, the stars are sort of aligned for what would it take, if you will, to get you to move over to UH? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just have to, uh, you know, th think about it uh, a little bit more. But, uh, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, if, if there's someone, for example, that's going to apply that I think would really do a good job that I could, Say, for, say, go call that person. Let's go and recruit that person to come uh, to do this job. Uh, so at that point in time, I, I think um, I think still very early on in the process. We don't know who else might be in the mix and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just have to wait and see. But it is an important position. Let's not minimize the importance of having a sports uh, uh, fever throughout this time. We've seen that with uh, Dave Shoji. Uh, people just got all excited. We've seen that now with Charlie Wade. Uh, we've seen it with June Jones and Dick Tomey uh, in the past. Uh, it just lifts the community in ways uh, beyond measure. And then also it's a major revenue generator. I personally would like to see, hopefully, that this could be the impetus to move that stadium along. We need a new stadium. I'm sorry, 15,000 seating capacity at the University of Hawaii will not do. Why? Because, again, it speaks to tourism. We're able to do major sports tourism events there. Uh, you know, I, rugby, soccer. Uh, football that uh, goes just beyond the University of Hawaii and so forth, and, and entertainment. Bruno Mars, you can put him back in the stadium there and get more than 10,000 people to come and see him perform. So it's major aspects of that job that could be very important, uh, is very important for the state of Hawaii. So at this point in time, it's just wait and see uh, how things pan out there. But I'm very busy with what I'm doing here, and I'm just going to continue to make sure we can get back to a robust tourism recovery. Uh, which is what I do each and every day getting up. I love what I'm doing, uh, but 
as I said, uh, <laughs> I don't stop taking phone calls. I'm so far in calls. Well, we definitely know you'll be getting probably more phone calls after this uh, <laughs> conversation. So thank you so much, uh, Mugi Hanuman from HLT, for joining us this morning. Give us an update, of course, on everything that's happening in the tourism industry and also uh, those uh, personal decisions that you may or may not have to make soon uh, down the line. But thank you so much, Mugi, for joining us. We appreciate it. Now I know that's a question you really wanted to get at. Through our <laughs> <laughs> it only took half an hour for us to get there, but we got there. <laughs> Thanks so much, thank you. Always Aloha. enjoy being with you folks. Aloha. Thank you. Well, great to get an update on him from him from the you know aspect of the tourism industry. You really hear about all the work that his organization is doing to try to lift up this industry. You know, every time we've talked to him, Ryan, we've talked about this Japanese visitor, the Asian tourist, you know, more broadly, and and when that market is coming back, they are hopeful. He says that they're not giving up hope, but it is not happening as fast as they would like, and as a result, uh, the the market is softer than they would like to see. We did not have a hundred percent. Uh, bookings in December. The holiday season was not as robust as they would like, and that is due in part to the lack of the Asian tourists. So how we build that back, that is a complicated process, but something that he says that he was pleased that the governor is already working on laying the groundwork visiting before he was even sworn in. So all of that sort of working toward re rehabilitating uh, that sector of our economy, the economic engine, if you will, for our state. You did hear him pushing back on green fees there, saying that he doesn't necessarily oppose an impact fee, but a blanket uh, tourism tax or arrival tax is not something that the industry supports. Yeah, and this is in line with what we heard the Senate president and House Speaker talk about as uh, during our conversation with them last week about uh, some of the challenges that may exist with trying to implement such a green fee and that this uh, more centralized, localized impact fee for certain destinations may be the path forward. Uh, you heard him speak a little bit about some of the mechanics that would have to go in place to implement something like that at various destinations throughout the state. But the thing is that uh, these are are these are things that are already happening uh, at a few destinations that would just have to be replicated in other areas, uh, but they are uh, open to a more specialized and specific impact fee rather than an overarching green fee that would be taxed to every tourist uh, member that is coming in. We also got an update on the importance of, of course, safety, especially in the Waikiki area and how that continues to be top of mind, ensuring that visitors uh, as well as residents who live in Waikiki feel safe with the environment that they are in through the Safe and Sound program, the weed and seed, if you will, of that area in working with the mayor and the prosecutor's office to ensure uh, that this is something that is top of mind, that visitors feel safe when arriving here in Hawaii. Yeah, Steve Alm will be on the program next week, as will the governor. So we'll ask both of them about uh, the things with, that we discussed today. We also heard about workforce development uh, that's happening and more of what they'd like to see when it comes to integrating tourism as part of the education experience for a lot of young people here and creating career pathways to that industry. And of course, we couldn't resist the personal news. Uh, you know, a big, big win for Hawaii, if you will, to have two people nominated by the Biden administration to serve in that advisory committee uh, um, and then, of course, the question of whether or not he would perhaps go to University of Hawaii. Yeah, a lot of names being tossed around right now, but no doubt Mufi's name is one that continues to come up in the conversations that I'm hearing every time that I'm at <laughs> UH. Uh, you know, everyone's always asking me, who's going to be the new athletic director? Well, his name definitely in the mix, and we heard his thoughts there. He's listening, uh, but no uh, but made it clear that it is not something he's pursuing, per se. But uh, always great hearing from him. We thank him for joining us on uh, Friday, we're going to be switching gears and focusing in on the uh, hospital on the Big Island. That's right. Kona Community Hospital's new CEO, Clayton McGann, is going to be joining us. He's been lobbying the legislature, saying that his organization needs $20 million, um, that their hospital is really at a critical juncture, that there are a lot of programs that they simply cannot afford to continue on with. Um, and that is such an important, literal lifeline for that part of our state. So we're going to be talking with him, and we hope that we'll be, ta we'll be talking with you as well. So join us right back here, 1030 on Friday, for another edition of Spotlight Hawaii. Aloha. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.